on this before. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, for you, O God, are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Uh, so question, you ever had one of those weeks that started with everything on top of the world, and by the end of the week, it seems as though everything has hit the fan. Have you ever had that? Well, welcome to Holy Week. <laughs> and that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit this morning. Um, but before we get to that, um, I want to talk to you about our final stage. Uh, we've been doing a journey over the course of Lent where we've been taking a look at the different stages of call. We ran through resist, which is the first stage. That time that <coughs> the call is coming, but you're not quite sure and you're pushing back on it to reclaim, where you're reclaiming your roots and where God has been a part of your life all along. And then on to stage three, revelation, where God begins to reveal God's self in amazing ways. And you begin to sense that God is calling you to something more and setting you apart. Then we cross the poison river of struggle and move on to risk, that risk-taking that we take to follow a call. And then we get into relating, and finally, we get to the today's stage, which is release. And I think it's a really appropriate message, especially for Holy Week, because I think Jesus teaches us some really interesting things about release to call and release from call. Um, and we'll talk about that as we walk through the week, but I want you to understand that. So release from call, it can mean a couple things. It could be leaving a call, that the call that you were called to is done for now, the season of that call is over, and that God is transitioning you to something else. So it could be released from call. It could be leaving that call. Or it could also mean releasing yourself to the call. In other words, uh, submitting to that call. Because here's the deal. In the first five stages, you're probably, in many cases, still holding on to the control of where that call goes, correct? Correct. Because how many of us are somewhat control freaks when it comes to that? We don't want to give things over to something that we don't necessarily see or completely understand because that's kind of scary. Releasing control creates security issues for us, makes us worry about where it might be. But God is calling us to trust him, correct? Has anybody ever heard the story or seen it on Facebook or whatever about the, the mountain climber, right? That... Uh, falls from the cliff and grabs hold and is holding on and it's dark and they can't see what's below and they cry out to God, God, save me, God, help me. And they hear a voice saying, let go, let go. And the person can't do that, can't do that, can't see what's below, thinking on a cliff, going to die. And the voice keeps saying, let go. And finally, the person loses strength, lets go, and the ground is like a foot below you know, it's, it's that type of thing. It's that journey that we have with God where we're thinking something awful is going to happen if we let go, but God is just saying, please let go. Please let me help you. Please let me guide you. That is submitting to call. That's offering ourselves up in submission, also relinquishing uh, that control to trust, fully embrace and trust that God's call is good for us. Because here's the deal, it's not easy. When God called me, I was teaching. That meant having to leave a job that I had worked really hard to get into. Something that was supporting and providing uh, money for the household and everything else. I had to go off to seminary. I didn't know where I was going to get the money for that. You know, submitting yourself completely and walking in a new direction is a scary thing. 
but I'm so glad I did. I know that now, looking back, now that I've submitted myself to what God wanted me to do, where I'm trusting in what God is asking of me as best I can, and it's a daily struggle to submit and let go and to release, but it's definitely what God wants from us. God has a bigger picture than we do, amen? And if we're people of faith, we need to let go and let God in those times. So let's see how release plays out in Holy Week. Let's walk through Holy Week to help us better understand how Jesus released in a couple different times. But let me set the stage first. This is something I don't think that we can completely understand, and it's something that we have to try to understand, or the things happening in Holy Week won't completely make sense to us. The people of Jerusalem, the people of that whole area, the people of Israel, were an occupied people. We don't get that. We haven't lived through that ourselves here in the United States. We have not been an occupied people. We have not had an outside force come in with their own government, with their own armies and everything else, and control every aspect of who we are. All right? So we have to put ourselves in a mindset of a people that don't even have control over their own liberty, over their own government, over their own security. This is a people that have been occupied. They trust in a God that's saying a Savior is going to come, but they're not living within the reality of that yet, but they're looking for it. They want desperately for a Messiah to come, and the Messiah is spoken to be the son of David. In other words, coming in and reestablishing the kingdom that David had. In other words, this Messiah is going to come in, kick the Romans out, reestablish rule in Jerusalem. Okay? So the people are looking for this Messiah. Now, there's another group of people there, too, that are also struggling with this being an occupied territory. These are the religious leaders, all right? Caiaphas, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all these people are living within the occupied territory as well, and they have some semblance of control. The Romans have given them the opportunity to have some control over the religious life of the temple and everything else, but it is a very tenuous relationship. If anything goes wrong, the Romans will come in and crush it. The Romans may even come in and tear the temple down that Herod the Great put up. And they're worried, and they're scared. In order to maintain what control they have, in order to maintain what peace they have, in order to maintain what religious authority and rule they have, depends on keeping shalom. It depends on keeping the peace. If anything riles it up, the Romans could come in and crush everything. And then they have nothing. This is the stage that we have set as we enter into Holy Week. Now, the other thing we need to know is that this is the time of Passover. People are coming from all over into Jerusalem to the temple as a pilgrimage to prepare for the Passover meal. So what do you think Caiaphas and the religious leaders are worried about in an occupied territory? Lots of people are coming. So now... Let's walk into Holy Week. So our scripture today talks about Jesus sending disciples out to get the donkey or the colt. He tells them to go, tells them where to find it. Thank you, Aiden, for sharing that story. They go and they get the colt and they bring it back. And they put Jesus on the colt and they bring him in. And everyone is shouting, Hosanna, which is like, hooray, okay? And what else are they shouting? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Why are they shouting this? Why do you think the people are lifting this up? Because they think Jesus is there, or they know Jesus is their Messiah. Messiah. And what did I say for an occupied people they're looking for in their Messiah? 
They're looking for someone that's going to come in and overthrow everything. So now you have thousands of people. And why do you have thousands of people? Because just before this, not long before this, Jesus was preaching in Jericho, like Alexa let us know, but he had also raised Lazarus from the dead. So all these miracles and this great preaching is happening, and then Jesus is coming in on a cult, which they have in their prophecies as what the Messiah would come into Jerusalem on. And in the church, we call it the triumphal entry. So here you have Jesus coming down, people laying clothes and people laying palms down, people shouting Hosanna, thousands of people coming into Jerusalem. And they're thinking, this is the time. Jesus is going to retake the throne. Jesus is going to establish himself as king. The Romans are going to get kicked out. God is going to be in control again, and everything is going to be good. Now, what did I say about the religious leaders? They're kind of worried about all that, right? Not because they don't want a Messiah, not because they don't want God to be in control of Jerusalem and everything else, but because they're worried about the Romans. They've lived under this occupation. They've seen the horror that the Romans can do. They're worried. So what do they say to Jesus? Tell them to be quiet. Tell them to hush. And Jesus says, you know, even if they were quiet, the stones would begin to shout praise. Hmm. So we're really setting the stage here for what's happening. So entering Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, people glorifying. What does Jesus do then? Jesus goes to the temple. And when he gets to the temple, what does he find? He finds money changers. He finds things happening in the temple that shouldn't be happening. So what does he do? Now, meanwhile, he's got all these people following him, seeing him as the new Messiah, and he comes into the temple, takes the tables, overturns them, goes through the whole table, temple, and gets rid of all these people that are in there, saying, you have made this, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, you've made it a den of thieves. So what do you think the religious leaders are thinking? Oh, great. They're going to see this. This is going to be a rebellion. The Romans are going to come in. The people are seeing this as, yes, this is one more step. Okay, we've hit the temple. Now let's go take out Pontius Pilate, right? But it's not what happens. So the overturned tables happen, and then Jesus goes on to gather the disciples and the crowd and begins preaching to them. And he teaches salacious things that challenge the religious leaders. So he's making the religious leaders upset. And it forces their hands to begin a plan to try and stop Jesus. But then Jesus, in teaching his disciples and everyone else, begins to talk about and warn about the destruction of the temple. The destruction of Jerusalem. They're not the words that people, the people or the disciples want to hear. They want to hear, okay, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. We've all gathered. We're ready. We're going to take this back. I'm going to be the king. You're going to be my people. God is going to be our God, and everything is going to be good. And instead, they're getting messages that the temple is going to be torn down, that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. That is not what they want to hear. So you got the religious leaders putting plans together to stop Jesus. you got people that came in with the triumphal entry shouting Hosanna, hearing everything's going to get wiped out. These are not the messages that they want to hear. And then Passover comes on Thursday. And they're gathered together in the upper room for the meal. And Jesus takes the bread and breaks it and said, This is my body broken for you. Jesus broken? This is my cup of the new salvation. This is my blood shed for you. Jesus' blood shed? These are not the words that they wanted to hear. Even one of Jesus' own, Judas, the disciple, becomes dismayed and sets a plan to betray him. Why? Not because he doesn't love him, but because he thinks that he's not really the Messiah. He's not the one. 
the one was going to overturn everything and get rid of the Romans and establish new rule. But that's not what Jesus was preaching about. They weren't, he wasn't seeing it. A lot of the people weren't seeing it because the Messiah that Jesus is, is the one that's establishing eternity, the one that's going on to heaven to prepare a place for all of us. But the Jesus that they wanted, the Messiah that they wanted, was the one that was going to establish political rule right there. Two different things happening. So after this supper, Jesus gathers his disciples and he goes out to the garden. So here we are holy, on Holy Thursday, right? And he goes out to the garden and he gets on his knees and he prays. And he asks the disciples to pray with him and to stand guard while he prays. And he's praying and he's praying. And what does he ask of God? Take this cup from me. I don't want it. I don't want to go through this. I see what you're saying. I see where things are leading. I know what's about to happen, and I don't want this. God, I don't want it. Jesus is praying in agony, but what does he finally say? Not my will, but yours be done. Does that sound a little bit like release to you? Not my will, but yours be done. And that's not a release from call. That's a release to call. God has called him to take that journey, to follow it through, to see where it goes from there, to go to that cross, and Jesus submits. We need to learn that lesson because it's something that God wants of us too. They may not have known it at the time, but they definitely knew it on Sunday. We're not there yet. So then he prays, and he says, not my will but yours, and he continues the journey, and now we're at Good Friday. He's been handed over to the temple. He's been handed over to Herod. He's been handed over to Pontius Pilate. Uh, Many of the people that may have been shouting Hosanna on Monday were shouting crucify him on Friday, and we have Jesus on a cross being crucified. And what are the words that Jesus says from the cross? There's many. But he said, into your hands, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then he said, it is finished. Another set of words that sound like release. And for that moment, that was release from that call. Jesus had finished what needed to be done on earth at that moment right? So on Thursday, you have released two call, not my will, but yours be done. And on Friday, release from call into your hands. I commit my spirit. It is finished. It is finished. This is the journey that we're taking over the course of this week. These are the things that are happening. These are the things that we need to understand. This is what we need to know about who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing. But don't forget we have a hope. Tony Campolo is a national speaker, but he's also a professor at Eastern University, and he has a famous sermon that he loves to preach called Fridays Here, But Sundays. Anybody heard it? No, you haven't. Okay, so, sorry. It's a famous sermon, and it's Friday's here, but Sunday's coming. Friday's here, but Sunday's coming. So he's pointing people toward a hope that is about to happen. So Friday is here. Jesus has submitted. Jesus has released. But brothers and sisters, Sunday is coming. So I invite you, come on Easter to find out how God is making all things new, how God is going to make all things new, how God made it, how God is making it each and every day. Beloved, Jesus had a call. Jesus was God's son, fully God, fully human. Jesus let it out. Jesus submitted. Jesus released. He gave us an example of how we are to follow through that call. What made it easy for Jesus was processing through all those other stages that we've talked about so far. 
So all the stages that we've learned over the past several weeks of Lent, reflect on them, pray on them, discern them. What is God calling you to do? Who is God calling you to be? What do you need to release in order to follow that call and allow it to be lived out in you? And are you willing to release enough, even when you don't see Sunday coming, to trust that Sunday will come even in your own call? that God will follow through and be faithful in all of that. So this is the message of Holy Week. So as you go through this week, understand what's happening every step of the way. Jesus has entered Jerusalem. We have the triumphal entry. We have the shouts of Hosanna. Now walk, us, walk through with us as we hit Holy Thursday and as we hit Good Friday, and then come and find out what happens on Sunday morning. Amen. Um, The discipleship reflection for this week, in order to understand release, I encourage us all to follow the journey of Christ this holy week through all of the services, as we will experience Christ's release for call in the garden, release from call on the cross, and God making all things new on Easter morning.